Welcome and shalom, my friends. Thank you for joining me today. We're tackling a very difficult subject. Can a Christian be possessed by demons? It's a question that many of us, it just like scares us to even consider it or think about it. I think you're going to find my word today comforting, helpful, empowering, and that Yeshua will use it to bring you in to greater freedom. Let's just begin by asking the Lord's blessing. Father, we pray as we look to you today for understanding that you would bring deliverance and freedom to each and every one of your children that's looking to you for help and to enter into a greater element of our inheritance in you, which is freedom and power and life. I remember years ago, beloved ones, as a young preacher, ministering to a young person in their teens that seemed to be demon-possessed, and I was totally clueless as to how to handle the situation. I had had no training on it. The only thing I knew how to do was to yell at the demons, yelling at the demons to leave. It was quite comical looking back on it. And I had an older pastor with me at this time. And after we left this young man's house, the older pastor said to me, you know, he said, when your knife is sharp. You don't have to cut so hard. And so the answer for freedom is not just screaming, beloved, it's revelation, understanding, and knowing how to operate in the truth. We're going to be looking today in the Word of God to gain a better understanding of how demons can be affecting your life and my life as believers. Again, it's difficult for us to even consider this. Many people are so afraid of even the word demon, they don't even want to consider the possibility that they could be affected by demonic presence in their life. So let's begin by going straight to the Word of God. I want to go to the book of Luke to set the stage here. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the Word of the Lord, beloved ones, abides forever. Luke chapter 4, verse 33. In the synagogue, now catch that, where was this man that we're going to see had a problem with the demon? He was in, listen, the synagogue. He wasn't in the bar. He wasn't living a low life life. He was in the synagogue. So once again, picking back on the text. In the synagogue, there was a man possessed by the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice. So I just wanted to stay at the onset that this one that had a problem with the demonic spirit was not out living a loose life. He was in the synagogue. He was in the house of worship. This was the place where people that were worshiping God and wanted to know God came to. And yet here in God's house in the synagogue was a man that had an issue with an unclean spirit. Please don't, don't be afraid. I want to encourage you. Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set us free. Paul told us that our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against powers of wickedness and darkness in heavenly places. Just consider with me, because I want you to practice discipline now, and don't run, and stay tuned to the end here. If Jesus, when he walked on the earth, did the same three things in almost every village he went to, and those three things were he preached the gospel of the kingdom, he drove out unclean spirits, and he healed the sick. Every place he went, beloved friends, Jesus did those three things. He preached the gospel, he healed the sick, and he drove out the demons and set people free. So the question is, if the New Testament is an accurate representation of who Yeshua is and what he did on the earth, and you believe that today. You believe the, the recorded Word of God. You believe the historical account of the New Testament as it records Jesus' ministry. And we see Jesus continually driving out demons and freeing people from them. If you believe that, if you say you believe God's Word, let me ask you the question. Are the same demons that were on the earth when Yeshua walked on this planet 2,000 years ago, are those same demons still here today? And yet many Christians act as if there's no such thing as demons, or at least they don't want to consider the fact that it might be an issue that they have to deal with. But if Jesus, Yeshua, deal with, deal with it continually, then you and I should wake up and realize that we too are in a war 
And this is why the scripture tells us that we should not be ignorant of the schemes of the devil. So I want to encourage you, get your armor on and stay tuned to the end because I think you're going to find some help. And I think you'll also learn how to minister to others that may need some help. It takes discipline sometimes to stay attuned to a teaching that lasts more than five minutes because of the hamburger helper culture that we live in today. But to go deep in God takes time. I just want to encourage you, practice this one. Stay with me to the end here and share your testimonies, by the way, on the YouTube channel. Let's go to the next verse. Mark chapter 1, verse 39. And he went into their synagogues. Notice again, it's taking place in the synagogue. And he went into their synagogues throughout all Galilee, preaching and casting out the demons. Okay, so we're on the same ground now. We're on solid ground. Yeah, I see that Jesus was driving demons out of people in the synagogue. So if that was true 2,000 years ago, the question that we ask ourselves, are there still people sitting in church gatherings that have an issue with demons? The real question is, can a Christian be possessed by a demon? Jesus encountered them in places of worship. Today, that would be a, a, a church. Can a Christian be possessed by a demon? We have to define what possession means before answering. The word possession implies ownership. A Christian cannot be owned by a demon or the devil. Because a Christian, a believer in Yeshua, in Jesus, is owned by Yeshua. They're owned by the Father. A Christian cannot be possessed by a demon. However, demons, and I want you to get this, can occupy space in a believer's life. Let me say it again. A Christian cannot be possessed by a demon, but demons can occupy space in a believer's life, psychologically, physically, uh, uh, again, mentally, even in their bodies. Some illnesses can be caused by demons. So Christians cannot be possessed by a demon, but demons can occupy space in a believer's life. A really good example of this comes from the Word of God where we see Yeshua going into the temple. Yeshua goes into the temple, and at the entrance of the temple, what does He find? He finds the money changers. And what does Yeshua do? He takes a whip and drives the money changers out because they had no right to be there. They were occupying space in God's holy temple. And in the same way that those money changers had no right to be in the temple, but were there and needed to be driven out in the same way, beloved, demon presences need to be driven out of many of our lives. The good news is, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And I'm going to talk with you today about how to do this. I remember some time back, I had a dream that really marked me and bring me a lot of revelation as to the subject of demons occupying space. And in this dream, beloved ones, approximately 15 years ago, I was in this house, I was living in this house, and this house was really small. It was like probably like 400, it was just a one room, real, really a shack. It was a wooden shack, and the wood in this home, it looked like it was termite infected. It looked like if you put a 100 pound bag of sand on the roof of it, the whole roof would have caved in. It looked like it was so deteriorated from the termite inspection. And this was my house. I was living in this one room, dilapidated home, totally depressing place to be living. In this home, this dilapidated home that I was living in, there was a window. And when I looked out the window in the dream, beloved ones, I was able to see right across the street from my house that I was in this dilapidated house, I was able to see right across the street, there was a brand new, brand new contemporary home, you know, 2,500 square feet, beautiful, just gave you a great feeling looking at it because everything was so clean and so, so upscale. And as I looked at that beautiful home across the street, the Lord spoke to me. I'm saying he literally spoke to me. The Spirit spoke to me audibly. And he said to me, that's your home. That beautiful home across the street that I looked at, the Spirit said to me, that's your house. And I said, well, if, I, if that's my house, why am I not living there? 
And then all of a sudden, the Lord opened up my eyes and I saw that living in that brand new contemporary home that was mine were demons. The demons look like people, but I could tell that they were demons because of the incredible, violent hatred spirit in them, just an energy that was beyond anything that I had encountered ever in this world. I knew they were demons. But I was so sick and tired of living in the dilapidated house that I'd been in that I decided I was going to walk across the, across the street and take possession of the house that the Lord said was mine. The reason that I had not taken possession of that beautiful house that was mine, beloved ones, and get this, was because I had been afraid of those demons that were squatting in my beautiful house. I was afraid to confront them. I was afraid to face them. I was afraid of what they would do to me if I tried to go into my beautiful home. So I decided that I was just going to live in this shallow, oppressed life because I was afraid to confront the demons. But I got so sick and tired of the state that I was in, I made up my mind. I'm not going to live like this anymore. I'm going to go and confront those demons that are in my beautiful home, and I'm going to take possession and enter into that big, beautiful space. So I walked over to that home across the street, and I was able to recognize in the dream, in the vision of the night, it was all coming by revelation of the Spirit, that there was a head demon in that home. I don't know how many there were, a dozen maybe, it's hard to say, but there were many. But I knew that there was one that was the head demon. And I walked over to that home, I waited outside the door, the entrance into that home, for that head demon to come out. And I waited, and when that head demon finally came out, I took a hold of him. Like I said, he, was, he looked like a man, so I took all of them by his clothes, I threw them on the ground, and I just started wailing on them. Bam, 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 bam. But you know what? As I was punching, it didn't feel like I was having any effect on that demon at all. I felt impotent. I felt like my punches were powerless. But I was so committed, beloved one, to getting free I had so made up my mind that I wasn't going to go back to live in that dilapidated shack anymore that I just kept on punching and going forward, even though I felt totally, like I said, powerless. And all of a sudden, bam, nothing happens. Totally powerless feeling. But I kept going, bam. You know what happened on that next punch? All the power went out from that man. The demons left. And it was like, he was gone. And it's really interesting to me that I was, as I was coming against that demon, he was making me feel like I was powerless, that I had no effect on him as I was coming against him with power, you know, forcing him to get out. But he didn't realize that I wasn't going to quit. And because I wouldn't quit, he broke. And the same thing will happen in your life. When you make up your mind that you're going to get free, that you're going to stop living under oppression, that you're going to stop living under guilt, that you're going to stop living under generational spirits, that you're going to stop living under addiction of lust or substance. When you make up your mind that you're going to stop being a, living, living a life of fear, when you make up your mind that you're going to enter into what Jesus promised you when he said, if the Son shall make you free, you'll be free indeed, and begin to go against and come after those demonic spirits that are pressing you down and keeping you from living in abundance and freedom, when you make up your mind to get free and commit yourself to Jesus, to walk in his footsteps as the Holy Spirit leads you and guides you, eventually what's going to happen is the demons are going to lose their grip on your life and you're going to break forth into a brand new freedom, level after level after level after level after level. Now, I want you to stay with me because I want to teach now how demons gain entrance and how we can close doors. We've established the fact that Christians cannot be possessed by a demon, but demons can occupy space. Even, for example, as you can be a believer, you can be a Christian, and yet there can be an infection in your body, right? Your, your body is infected with something. Or you can be a Christian and have a headache. Or you can be a Christian and get a virus. In the same way, you can be a Christian and demonic spirits can occupy space. And demons will not leave on their own. They're not gentlemen. You can't just say to them, you know, I really don't like it that you're here. Would you please leave now? They don't understand that. 
They understand two things, and I'm going to get into those two things in a second. But we need to recognize that there's a war that we're fighting. Again, Paul said our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against powers of wickedness in heavenly places. And now what I want to do is talk about how demons gain entrance and how we can close the doors. And then we're going to talk about the next step of how to get free. Stay under the teaching of the word, beloved, and God will use it to set you free. You shall know the truth, Yeshua said, and the truth shall set you free. So first of all, one of the reasons that we should be fearful of sinning is because when we willfully sin, we open the door legally for demons to enter. Remember at Jesus, Yeshua healed somebody, and many of the people that He healed were sick because they had demons. Not everybody for sure, but some of the people that Yeshua healed, the people were, were, uh, were sick because of a demon. And so Yeshua healed somebody, and then He said to the person He healed, Sin no more, that nothing worse may befall you. What does this teach us? That sinning opens the door for negativity, for demonic entity and power to enter our life. And so when we are living a life, particularly of willful sin, we put ourselves in a position where there is not a protection, there is not a covering, and that Satan has a legal right to come in and enter. Not to possess, but to enter and occupy space, which brings torment to the believer. So first of all, demons gain entrance through sinning, and this is why we should be fearful of sinning. If you don't want a demon, don't practice sin. If you practice sin, you're opening up a door for demonic spirit to enter. Secondly, demons enter through unforgiveness. This is why Yeshua said, when you pray, pray in this way. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven those that have trespassed against us. Demons enter through unforgiveness. I remember once again, the Lord, forgive me for sharing so many of my dreams and visions of the night with you, beloved friends, but this is how the Lord has so often spoken to me and marked me and helped me to understand how to walk. I've learned so much from the Lord at night. But I remember years ago, over 10 years ago, I had an experience one night, a vision of the night. And in this vision of the night, again, I was in a home and somebody behind me, it was like a tormenting spirit. It was a tormentor. Somebody was put, was, what, behind me was tormenting me, and as I was in this home, I kept on running from room to room trying to escape this tormenting spirit that was behind me that kept on oppressing me and hurting me and bringing me pain. I felt like if I ran to another room in the home, I'd be able to get free or escape this tormenting spirit, this oppressing spirit. So this was going on in this vision of the night, I was running from room to room. I go to this room, that room, this room. Wherever I went, whatever room I ran to, the demon kept chasing me and was, you know, foul me to the next room, to the next room. And then the Lord spoke to me in the spirit and he said to me, release them. And then he showed me somebody in my life that I had unforgiveness and ill will towards. And it was like I was arrested by the Lord. It was like a beam of light came down upon me, showing me this person that I had unforgiveness and ill will towards. And the Holy Spirit said to me, release them. And so I spoke out. I said, Lord, I release them. I release you. And as soon as I let go of my unforgiveness and my bitterness towards that person, as soon as I release that, the tormentor left. I was trying to escape the tormentor by running from one room to another room. I couldn't escape that way. But as soon as I forgave the person the Lord showed me I had unforgiveness and ill will towards, as soon as I released them and stopped trying to hurt them in my spirit, bam, that tormentor left. And so demons gain access through unforgiveness. So if there's anybody in your life right now that you have unforgiveness towards, I'm just going to ask the Lord to bring that to your heart and mind before we go on that you'd be able to say to the Lord, Lord, forgive me, forgive me. You shed your blood for me and you shed your blood for that person that I have unforgiveness towards. I have no right to hold anything over them, Father God. You forgave me. I need to release them. So just think, is there a person in your life right now that this is pertaining to you about? 
Just lift it to the Lord. Father God, I, I, I forgive them. Just say to the Lord, Father, I release them. Lord, forgive me for holding bitterness and unforgiveness. Forgive me for my sin of unforgiveness. Lord, I release them and I bless them in Yeshua's name. Now you go on your way, my friend. And one of the things you want to do is don't keep looking back to that person. Just keep your eyes on Jesus, okay? Don't keep looking back to the person because then that old feeling of unforgiveness can be stirred up. Just keep your eyes on Jesus. He was on the cross. He said, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. You just keep your eyes on Jesus, beloved friend. Just keep saying, Lord, I forgive them and just move on. Be like Jesus. Okay, the next way that spirits enter, how do spirits gain access? And again, I'm talking to you personally right now. If you're dealing with something in your life, if you're dealing with a sex addiction, if you're dealing with a substance addiction, how do these spirits gain access? Oftentimes, spirits, demonic spirits, beloved friend, gains access through a generational spirit called also in the Hebrew Bible a familiar spirit. A familiar spirit is a demonic entity that has been in your ancestry, going back generations sometimes. It was in your parents' life. It was in their parents' life, and on and on. These spirits are passed on through generations. This is why, for example, you have somebody grow up and they say, you know what, I'm going to never be like my father. But they end up being just like their father. I remember a, a situation in my life that stands out very vividly when I was growing up. I had a friend, and uh, this friend, his parents were, were like swingers back in the 70s. In the 70s, there was a culture where there was actually wife swapping going on. And this friend of mine, I didn't find all this out till later in life when I you know, became an adult, but this uh, friend of mine, his parents were swingers. The, his mom and dad, this I was aware of, they got divorced and they married each other's best friends. In other words, it was his parents they, and they had best friends, a, a, you know, a, a husband and wife. And the two of those couples broke up and they, they traded wives and husbands. But this was the culture that they were a part of. So it was a very sexualized, immoral culture. Well, this friend, this friend of mine ended up leading a homosexual lifestyle and the daughters that were part of this family also became very, very sexualized in addiction to sexual spirits. Where did it begin? It began in the home with the parents. Same thing is true of alcoholism. It runs in the families. Same thing is true of poverty. It often runs in the families. So oftentimes, demonic spirits gain entrance because it has been in our generations. So right now, let's just break that. If you're dealing with something in your life, my, my, my beloved friend, my sisters and brothers, if you're dealing with something in your life right now that you know it didn't begin with you, it was in your parents' home or it was in your grandparents' home, I just want you to, let's lift that to the Lord right now. Father God, I break this thing off right now. Name that thing. I break this addiction off right now. I break this spirit of depression off right now. I break the spirit of anxiety off right now that's been in my family. By the blood of Jesus, I break it off my life and I move forward in you, Jesus, into the freedom that you promised me and I crush this thing under my feet in the name of Yeshua the Nazarene. Amen and amen and amen and amen. I have a book that I wrote called Self-Deliverance. I, I take you through the whole process. Let's continue on here. How else do demons gain act, access? They gain access sometimes through the wounding of others. If you were bullied, for example, in elementary school or as a young person, sometimes the wounding that you received from others open up access for demons to come in and begin to take a hold of your personality and your thinking until you now are, are literally inhabited by a demon. Don't be afraid Jesus came to set us free. I'm just saying demons can enter in through the wounding of others. For example, some people that are living in the LGBTQ lifestyle now, they were picked on when they were in school. Or they were picked on or abused. Many have been sexually abused. And the wounding they received from others, Satan took to gain entrance into their lives. 
So you might want to lift that up. If there's something that happened to you when you were young, if you were picked on, if somebody said something to you, even if your parents spoke a curse over your life, that could have opened up a door for a demonic spirit to gain entrance. But in order to get free, you need to identify the door that that demon came in from, cast it out in the name of Yeshua, and then close that door. We're going to talk more about it, but I'm just giving you an overview right now. And finally, I want to say that demons can gain entrance through trauma, general trauma. When a person is in a very weakened state, maybe they've been to war and they've been broken down through war. It could even be something that happened uh, 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 physically. But when people are in a state of trauma and they're weakened, Yeshua said in his word through his apostle that Satan roams the earth looking for somebody to devour. He's looking for the weak one. And so sometimes demons gained access into our life, beloved ones, when we were in a weakened state, when we were in a state of trauma. Okay, now that we've established how demons can gain access into our life, let's talk briefly about what we can do to close doors so that those demons no longer have access. First of all, We close the door by confession. If you're aware that some of the things that I'm sharing with you are pertinent to you, that they're clicking with you, then the next thing that you want to do is you just want to talk to the Lord and say, Lord, I realize that what Rabbi Shander is communicating to me, it's truth. It's your truth. And Father, I ask you today to help me and save me and heal me. And I want to close the doors in my soul and in my mind and in my heart in every area of my life so that demon access is no longer there. Father, I confess, so let's say, for example, it's a sin in your life, that you have been living in in some type of habitual sin, and it's through that sin that a demon access. Now you confess that sin to the Lord. Confess the sin to the Lord. If you've been in unforgiveness, confess that sin to the Lord, as we talked about earlier. If there's been a generational issue in the family, confess that sin to the Lord. It begins by confession, becoming aware and confessing, bringing it to the light. Because demons run when they're exposed in the light. The next thing is repentance, which closely follows confession. The next thing is you stop doing what you were doing that puts you in a territory where demonic influence could enter. So Repentance might mean for you that if you're, uh, if you're a, a, a substance addict, that you make up your mind through the grace of God through which you could do all things, that you're going to repent and ask the Lord for power of that substance addiction. Stop. If it's food addiction, many of you right now are watching and you're, you, you know you're obese, you know you're way overweight, you feel terrible about it, it's making it hard on you, you have a hard time even getting around, walking around, you know that it's not glorifying God. What you do, you confess that to God, you ask Him for help, and by the grace of God, you make up your mind to treat your body as a holy temple. Because our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we have to realize, we're talking about repentance now, and one of the ways that Satan brings us into bondage is through gluttony, by causing us to become obese so that we loathe ourselves, and we're bringing all kinds of sickness on ourselves because we're sinning by not treating our body the way it should be treated. We have to recognize that our bodies are God's temple. The Holy Spirit lives in our bodies. And so our bodies do not belong to ourselves. Your body does not belong to you, beloved one. Your body belongs to the Lord. And so we repent by saying, Father God, I'm going to stop treating my body as if it belongs to me. I'm going to stop sinning against you, and I'm going to stop sinning against my body by putting the wrong food in my mouth or by overeating. The second thing you do to cut off demons is repent in whatever area you need to repent in. If you're dealing with sexual, uh, sexual sin, then what do you do to repent? You stop putting yourself in places. If you're watching pornography, you make up your mind by the grace of God. You get serious with God and you can do all things to, through Christ that strengthens you that you're not going to watch it anymore because if you're watching pornography, you're opening up the door for demons to enter your life that will destroy you in the end and rob you of every good thing that God has for you. A beautiful marriage, a beautiful family 
all those things that God wants for you, you're forfeiting by indulging in the demonic realm of an unreality, pornography. And by the way, let me say to you, because I know that so many people are dealing with pornography, do you know the first command that God gave Israel was to worship Him alone and to make no graven image? Now we think of that first commandment of worshiping God alone and making no image in His likeness to worship it. We think about that just as if we would not worship like a statue, a stone, or something of that nature. And that is true. But did you know in Orthodox Judaism, they don't have pictures of themselves all over their home. And in ultra-Orthodox Judaism, they don't use their phone at all, or if they do, only for business. Why? Because they recognize that all the pictures that we put all over our home and all the Facebook posts, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they're images. When the Lord said, don't make any graven image, one of the things that can be derived from that, in my view, is that we should not live in a world of images because the world of images is a world of unreality. As soon as you begin, you know, people go on vacation, and it's okay, I guess, to take a picture or two, but some people go on vacation or they have a wedding, and the whole event is based on taking pictures, people living in the realm of images. And then we get into our relationship with our, with our spouse, and we're unhappy because we have an image of what marriage should look like. Where do we get the image? We got the image from someone that put up there a false image of what marriage is supposed to look like. We picked it up on television. We picked it up on YouTube. We picked it up somewhere. We got an image of what reality is supposed to be, but the image is not the substance. And if we're in the realm of images, we're going to be deceived, and we're going to end up being tortured by the images that captured our lust. So if you're in pornography, I'm telling you, you're in a realm of images. Images are not reality. Reality is relationship, not images. Even our bodies that we take such good care of to look good, they're just going to fade away. We're not our bodies. Our bodies are just our image. So you need to come out of the realm of images if you're going to be delivered from deception. Satan moves in the realm of images. Images are not reality. So we repent. And then, beloved, as I said, we forgive. Now, moving forward, we're going to break into some new territory now. And I want to just give you a heads up that I'm about to show you some things that will be disturbing for some. I want to encourage you, do not run. Think about this. When Yeshua walked on the earth, He cast out demons everywhere He went. Okay, so if we accept the New Testament, we need to face reality. Demons are real. There's two types of ways that people get set free. One is a power encounter. The other is a truth encounter. I want to show you now a power encounter that took place in Enugu, Nigeria. Do not run. Face reality. Let's take a look. Ooh, he's healing right now. Jesus is here. Jesus is moving. Come on. Jesus is healing right now. Right now. I want you to bring this woman on stage for a second. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and tongue confess. Oh, yeah. That Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, Jesus, boy, you know, In Jesus' name, open your eyes and look at me. Satan, I command you to flee. Look at me. Many Christians don't like to talk about demons. They would just uh, like to think, oh, that was just uh, the way they talked back in the days when the Bible was written. But I will say this. If there's any doubter out there, if you would see what I see and look into the eyes of people that are demonized, you would walk away bewildered and be absolutely convinced that demons are real and they inhabit people today. Look at me in Jesus' name. Lift her up for a second. We're going to ask Jesus to come in now and protect you. I declare now that I am free now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You okay, honey? Oh, praise God. Let's give the Hallelujah. Lord a hand. 
many of the countries that I travel to and minister the Word of God are countries that were raised in voodooism, witchcraft, and the worship of ancestral spirits. And because of that, demons have gained entrance. And we see demons sometimes popping out of the crowd like popcorn. So many people are getting delivered as they begin to teach and preach the Word of God. These demonic entities are real. I've seen it happen in the States as well. This is called a power encounter where the kingdom of God breaks in to the realm of darkness and sets people free. Again, the two ways people get freed from demonic entities are power encounters and truth encounters. The thing that I've noticed that overwhelmingly sets people free during a power encounter is number one, a command to Satan to flee and to release God's child. But secondly, what sets people free is when the demons encounter the beautiful peace, shalom, and love of God. You saw that young woman in the clip that we just rolled for you when we brought her on the platform. I commanded the demon and I commanded that woman to look into my eyes. And as soon as the demon looked into my eyes, through that woman's eyes that he was inhabiting, immediately he broke and had to leave because he could not look into the love and the peace of the Holy Spirit that was shining through my eyes. So peace brings power. The scripture says that the God of peace, the God of shalom, will soon crush Satan under your feet. And so I, I've noticed that when, wherever I've gone, when I've commanded the demon to look into my eyes, immediately they, flow, they have fleed. The other way that we minister deliverance and freedom to people, and what you can do for yourself, is what I encounter a truth encounter. Now a truth encounter is when we go after the lies that people are believing that are allowing or creating an opportunity or a house for Satan to inhabit. In other words, if you believe that depression is normal, maybe you grew up in a home where your parents were depressed, your mom was depressed, or your dad was depressed, so you grew up in a home where depression was the normal presence there, the normal attitude. If you believe that depression is normal and to be tolerated, Satan is going to be more than happy to occupy that space in your life. Because depression comes from the devil. Depression is, uh, is darkness. It's hopelessness. It's sadness. It's lostness. You see, thoughts come from either the realm of light or from the realm of darkness. Depression is a result of a thought. And so thoughts of hopelessness, sadness, depression, these are all coming from the realm of darkness. They're not just human. We can't just treat mental illness with drugs. Drugs can mask the, sim the symptoms, but mental illness at its very core comes from the spirit realm. It comes from thoughts. I'm not saying that there's no place for, for drugs, etc., or psychiatrists. I'm just saying that is not the root, and that is not the genesis or the answer. The answer is that our mind would be thinking right thoughts, and this comes from Jesus. And so truth encounters involve recognizing the lies that we're believing about ourselves. Maybe we're telling ourselves bad things about ourselves. Maybe we're telling ourselves we're ugly. Maybe we're telling ourselves we're not smart. Sometimes we don't even realize what's going on in our subconscious mind. But until we confront the wrong thoughts that we're thinking, either consciously or unconsciously, those demons that are occupying wrong thought will continue to have access uh, and rest upon our lives. So a truth encounter is when the Holy Spirit illuminates us to recognize what we're dealing with and then to come against what we're dealing with and speak the opposite to the lie. So first of all, we identify what is the lie that I'm believing about myself. Let's say, for example, for you, it's low self-esteem. You see, Satan is the accuser of the brethren. That's a demonic problem, right? If you're walking around under self-accusation and self-rejection, that's not normal. That's not just a psychological problem. It's not something that can just be natural explained, naturally explained. The root problem of this is that there's a devil that is the accuser of the brethren. He seeks to seek, he seeks to kill, steal, and destroy. Accusation, self-rejection, this is all demonic energy. 
So if you're thinking bad thoughts about yourself, those thoughts need to be broken for you to enter into freedom. So it's important for you to identify what negative thoughts you're thinking about yourself and then confess the opposite according to what God's Word says about you. So for example, if you're thinking about yourself that you're stupid, you need to say, I reject you, Satan. You're a liar. Get out of my head. I am a genius in the Holy Spirit. If you're thinking that you're ugly because you look at your physical form, you say, I reject you, Satan. You're a liar. Get out of my head. I am beautiful to God. And Father, I thank you that I do not consist simply of this physical body that's going to return to the dust, but that you see something beautiful and precious in me beyond anything I could even imagine right now. I thank you, God, that I'm beautiful to you, that I'm so beautiful and valuable to you, that you sent Jesus, your son, to die on the cross to purchase me for yourself that you love me and that I'm precious and beautiful and valuable to you and I'm going to stop telling myself these bad things about myself and I'm going to cut you off Satan from speaking to me about this anymore. Maybe you're finding yourself walking around in a spirit of accusation towards other people. This will bring you into bondage as well. If you recognize that you're feeling accusatory towards people and hateful towards people, know that what's operating through your life is a demon. Satan is the one that accuses others. Satan is the one that hates others. Satan is the one that rejects others. You need to break that spirit off from operating through your life. And when you break it off from operating in your life towards others, when you stop releasing judgment, when you stop releasing accusation towards other people, when you stop releasing ill will towards other people, what's going to happen is the result will be you will be cleansed and bathed in the Holy Spirit and set free. So we have to recognize the demonic energy that's operating in our life. We need to come against it in the name of Yeshua of Nazareth. And then we need to speak the truth about the situation. So for example, if you're feeling ill will towards somebody and you recognize it's a demon, you reject it. I reject you, Satan. Get out of my head. And then you say, Father, you love this person. Forgive me for allowing myself to condemn this person. You love them, Father. I will bless them today. So the second way of getting free is to identify the demon and command it to go and speaking truth in the place of what you once believed. It's important, beloved, to come against violently in the spirit demonic entity. Demons are not gentlemen. They don't leave you know, just when you ask them to, you have to come against them. I want to show you a couple of scriptures here. Let's look at the book of Mark chapter 1, verse 23 and 25. Hear the word of God. Just then, there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit and he cried out. And Jesus rebuked him saying, be quiet. Notice that Jesus rebuked him. Re rebuke is a strong word. It's a, he, Jesus is speaking at that demon. He's commanding that demon. And we want to have that same holy violence, that same holy rage against demonic entities in our life, even as Yeshua displayed when he drove the money changers out of the temple with the whip. Jesus rebuked him. He rebuked the demon saying, be quiet and come out of him. And so it's the same thing in our life. We violently reject the demon. We don't, we don't pet him. We don't play nice with him. Notice another scripture here, Matthew 8, 16. When evening came, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, not a few. This is a big problem, beloved one. This is a problem for us, the children of God. We need to recognize this. Many who were demon-possessed, listen now, and he cast out the Spirit with a word. So it's biblical to speak at the demonic energy that you need to deal with. It can be silently, just coming from your heart, through your mind, or it can be out loud, whatever the Lord does. And I like to simply use a command, I reject you, Satan, get out of my head. And then I begin to confess the truth. I replace the lie with the truth. And what I find has happened in my life over and over and over again is that the demon begins to lose its grip. As I practice rejecting the demon, demonic energy, speaking at it, get out of my head, and then speaking out loud, confessing the truth, slowly that demon begins to lose its grip 
Eventually it lets go and leaves and I'm transformed over and over and over again to ever increasing levels of sanctification, purity, and innocence. And the same is true for all of us. We must overcome. Jesus said, He that overcomes will inherit these things seven times in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3. So we're in a war. Paul said our fight is not against flesh and blood, it's against principalities of darkness. We're in a war, we need to face the entities, speak at them, command them to leave, and replace the lies with truth. And as we practice this, we get stronger and stronger and stronger, and eventually get free. Jesus said, if you continue, notice that word continue, if you continue in my word, you've got to keep going. This isn't a one-time deal. This is if you continue in my word, Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. This is not a sprint. It's a marathon. But I'm a living example of someone that's been transformed. I have people that have said to me, Rabbi, you're not even the same person anymore. How? A lot of hard work in cooperating with the Holy Spirit and God's will for my life. And the same is true for all of us. We work with God to get free so that we can drive out the squatter from this holy, this holy temple, you and I, and make room for the Holy Spirit to rest in, and that we are lifted in, in to His glorious presence of experiencing His peace and His joy, His power and His pleasantness in our lives. Now, I want to make you aware of this, that sometimes people get free. From, from, from a demonic entity and they, and they feel free, they know they're free, all of a sudden they go outside and they can see the colors again like they did when they were children. There's, an, uh, there's a real deliverance that's taken place that oftentimes I've seen happen through what I call a, a truth consultation. What they, when they sit down with a deliverance minister and the deliverance minister helps them to confess helps them to identify the demonic entities that are operating in their life, helps them to replace the lies with truth. And through that cleansing process, the person almost feels like they're reborn. But we should realize that demons sometimes seek to return. Let me show you a scripture in the book of Luke, chapter number 4. We're looking now at what happened with Yeshua when he overcame the devil. And after overcoming the devil, the devil was trying to find a time to come back. So let's take a look at this and I'm sharing this with you just so that you'll recognize it's important always to keep your armor on. Why, for example, do some people quit smoking? They broke the habit for two years and all of a sudden one day they pick up a cigarette and they find themselves addicted to smoking again. It could be alcohol, cigarettes, pornography, whatever it is. Demons sometimes seek to enter back in after they've been driven out. So I want to encourage you, keep the armor on. Getting this word in you today will strengthen you and equip you, beloved. Hear the word of God, Luke chapter 4. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. When the devil had finished every temptation, he left him, listen now, until an opportune time. And so the devil left, but he left hoping that there would be a time that he might be able to come back in afterwards. And uh, Yeshua also, as I mentioned earlier, said to the person that he healed, sin no more, that nothing worse will befall you. You've got to keep your armor on so you can remain free and so that you can stay free. I want to share with you as I close today something that happened to me in my own journey. Uh, I, uh, I remember uh, uh, as a young uh, pastor, I was, uh, this was when I was back, I was like... Uh, what was I, in my, was I 20, 20s? You know, this was back like when I first started pastoring like in 1985. And I had no experience with people that had been dealing with demons. I'm talking about uh, uh, people that were having problems themselves with demons. I had no experience. I was never taught it in Bible school, never exposed to it. But one day I was pastoring this church in Reynoldsville, Pennsylvania. And a woman in my congregation said, I think my, my boy about 20 years old he was, has, is having a problem with the, with the demonic spirit. So um, I had no experience with this. So I uh, contacted another minister. I alluded to the story a little bit ago. And I said, listen, I don't really have experience with this. Um, uh, I'm going to go visit this guy, this kid, that 20-year-old guy that uh, his mom thinks he has a demon. Will you go with me? So we went over to this house where this boy was living. We went into his room. And beloved ones, as soon as I walked in to this boy's bedroom, you could feel thick 
the demons. And you could see the posters, the demonic posters in his room. And he was kind of living a um, transgender lifestyle. I mean, it was real. It was thick. I didn't know what to do. I was scared. I had no experience. I just began screaming at that demon because I didn't know what else to do. And that's where I picked up the, the story later where the older guy that was with me said to me, listen, you know, when your knife is sharp, you don't have, you don't have to cut so, so hard. That was my first experience with it. I, I knew nothing. I was completely ineffective. But I eventually realized that I need to get some training in this area. So I actually went to a ministry that specializes in training deliverance ministers. Now, I just want to share with you, you can't, uh, I don't, I, I'm not doing that on the ground anymore. I've trained others to do that. And I, and I wrote a book called Self-Deliverance so that you could minister deliverance to yourself. But I want you to just hear the story. So I, I go to get this training on ministering deliverance to people, ministering freedom to people. It's not just deliverance, it's into freedom. That's what happened to Israel. They were, were delivered out of bondage into the land of milk and honey, into freedom. So I spent some days with this deliverance ministry. I went through the process myself. Then I sat with them as they practiced the ministry, uh, you know, delivering others. And when I was done with my training period there, I brought it back to the congregation that I was shepherding, and I began to raise up a deliverance team. I began to train others how to do it. And as I raised up others to minister deliverance, we made it available to the congregation. We had so many people, my beloved brothers and sisters, that wanted help in this area, that realized that there were things in their life that they couldn't shake off, torment that they couldn't seem to get rid of. They began to sign up for deliverance. And pretty soon, we were doing it once a week, we had a schedule where we were booked up for two years. So I had people that were coming to me saying, I need help, I need help today. And we were saying, we want to get you on the schedule, but our next available appointment is in two years. And I was so torn up about this. I, said, I was like, Lord, what do I do? So the Holy Spirit inspired me. I want you to teach people how to deliver themselves through my grace. I want you to teach people on the spiritual art of self-deliverance. And so this is where the idea came from the book. It was a number of messages that I began to preach over a period of several months, training our people how to deliver themselves because I felt so grieved telling them they had to wait for two years to see a deliverance minister. So I encourage you, I'm going to roll a little clip at the very end of our broadcast today. I'll show you a little bit about, about it. But I just want to close today by praying for you. I love you. Thank you for your trust, for listening to me today. Father God, in Yeshua's name, thank you for these beloved ones, Lord, that have tuned into this broadcast under the sound of my voice, through your love, Jesus, and through your grace. Thank you that you're delivering them today. Thank you, Yeshua, that he that sets their hope on you will not be disappointed. Thank you, Yeshua, that whom the Son sets free is free indeed. So Father, I release right now healing and deliverance towards everyone that is listening and tuned in right now. I command spirits that are unclean in your life to leave. I take authority over every foul and unclean spirit. And I say, Satan, you must leave in the name of Yeshua, the Nazarene, that ultimately and completely defeated you at the cross and purchased this little one by his blood. You have no right, Satan. I command you to leave in the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach. I command Yeshua in your name, every spirit of lust, every spirit of greed, every spirit of pornography, every spirit of depression, every spirit of illness, every spirit of disease, every spirit of, uh, 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 I'm just hearing that word, uh, necromancy, I think it's pronounced, uh, occultic, every occultic spirit to leave. I command every demonic spirit of sadness to leave. And right now, Yeshua, I release supernatural joy and power and freedom and deliverance through your blood to your people. Yeshua, we look to you today. We look to the one that was crucified, buried, 
raised and ascended to heaven on our behalf. And we receive now, Yeshua, your fullness into our life. Thank you, King Jesus, for setting us free. Amen. I want to encourage you to keep on pressing on. Get the book. I think it will help you. Stay focused. Stay committed. Keep your eyes once again on Him going forward in obedience. And you will get free. That's the truth, beloved. And you can take it to God's spiritual bank. I really didn't know what else to do. There was just one area in my life I just couldn't seem to get control of. I had given up all hope. Demons are real. Many of the problems we deal with come directly from the realm of darkness. But freedom is available. Self-Deliverance by Rabbi K.A. Schneider. You don't have to wait for someone else to deliver you. With Jesus' help, you can free yourself. I believe again. As you move into Jesus' freedom, you'll find peace and clarity you have never known. Now I'm free. There is hope.